So when you uh, can really step back from the masks that you've been wearing, uh, what you've been calling as yourself, the thoughts and feelings you've been identifying with, you take a step back and you can rest as awareness. That's the first pillar fulfilled. Now mm -hmm. we can begin to consciously create because if our cups are full, we can't really create anything from a full cup. We need to first empty our cups, take our existing masks off so we can create the mask that is the most appropriate to put on. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment, you are going to hear the voice of a man who will tell you some tremendously important facts. Some amazing facts. Welcome to the reality revolution. Today, I have the one, the only quasi Joe here. He's been with the channel for a long time. We've done some interviews in the past. And if you follow Quasi's amazing YouTube channel, he discusses what we discuss. He is what I consider one of the masters of reality creation and advanced law of attraction techniques. He takes complicated concepts and makes them simple and easy. He's incredibly diverse in the different insights that he has. And he's taught me a lot about generating wealth through my own uh, reality creation processes. And finally, it's been a long time. I got a chance to talk to him again. I know he's very busy. So welcome, brother. How's it been, man? Dude, amazing. I mean, last time we talked, I don't even know if we, if I, if I had like a real, if I, what I would call a real company. So, you know, things have really, really changed uh, from the very last time we spoke. I think that was what, in like 2021? I, the last time I remember us speaking was when we went to dinner at Javier's in Newport Beach. And, Dude, and, that was a good and, time. And you just like, uh, just asked your wife to marry her. And she'd said yes, I believe, right at that oh, time. Wow. Remember? <laughs> And yes, we I were just that. both like super excited. Like we knew like we're about to have a lot of fun doing this. And we yeah. were talking about different topics. And I have always been following you. And your your videos have been absolutely amazing. And so if I'm sure that people, if they know me, they know you. But if they don't, you got to check out Quasi's channel. So let's step back because it's been a little while. So there's some new people following my channel. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got motivated in getting into reality creation in general and teaching this in the way that you do. Yeah. So, you know, my story, I, I don't know how similar it would be to other people's, but, you know, I, I honestly think it's different. Um, my journey to reality creation really came from a place of deep dissatisfaction with the status quo. So, mm -hmm. you know, back in 2018, I was in my senior year of uh, college and uh, junior year of college. I was finishing up junior year and uh, I was very dissatisfied with going into a nine to five and the thought of spending 40 years uh, in a career and then retire and only then to start my life, that idea did not resonate with me at all. And, uh, you know, I at the time did a summer internship at a box plant, a manufacturing plant in engineering. And when I went there, it was so depressing and every single person there just wanted to like stick their arms in the machines to get workers comp. So I was like, ah, this is, you know, I don't, I don't want to spend the rest of my life here. So I think I was fortunate enough to have an incident like that because I feel like a lot of the times uh, people are kind of like, you know, I don't know what I want to do, but then they get into a comfortable job that pays well. So they're like, ah, okay, this isn't painful enough to change. But I went through a situation where it was extremely painful, painful enough to change. And so I had to make an empowered decision to say, hey, this is not what I want. And so, you know, prior to that, I'd been dabbling in personal development, bettering myself. You know, it, it my, my journey with personal development actually came with dating. You know, like I, I got into the dating industry, uh, learned pickup. And uh, that's also how I met my wife. And, uh, you know, when I when I learned all that stuff, they also were talking about meditation. They were talking about using your mind to focus on outcomes and things that you want to create. So that part of it always really resonated with me as opposed to just getting results in dating. I thought, what if I could use these similar principles to apply them in different areas of life? And so uh, back in 2018, I remember one day I wrote in my journal, I was like, you know what, another day waking up at 5 a.m. to go into this job that I hate that starts at 7 a.m. My shift started at 7, 7 to 3. And, uh, you know, when my when my shift started, um, I was just like writing in my journal in that morning. And I was like, yeah, so I hope this will be like, I I'm just going to focus on gratitude today because my goal is that this is going to be my final job, the last job that I ever do. So I want to do it while I still have that journal entry. I think that was in like August of 2018 or something. 
And so from that point on, uh, you know, I, I, I really got deep into personal development. I, you know, consumed, read tons and tons of books, applied it. I started my YouTube channel because at the time, that's what I thought would help me uh, get to freedom, though I did not know how. I didn't know what I would sell on the channel. I had a vague idea. I was like, oh, you know, I see my friends close to me. They're selling merch. They're selling these journals and they they were making 10K a month. And I was like, dude, if I made like 5K a month, I could replace my job. And my parents would never give me shit because they paid for my for my college. Um, and so I was indebted to them, quarter million dollars indebted to them. And so I was like, I, I felt a moral, an obligation to to um, do something uh, so I could pay them back. So yeah, that's really how I got my in into personal development. So yeah, you and I have something in common and I have never mentioned it on my channel, but yeah, I started sort of getting interested in the law of attraction through wanting to date. And a lot of that material really recommended using visualization skills and different sort of techniques. And yeah. it worked, it worked. It, it, it created an environment in which you're interacting with someone else. It puts you into an environment where you imagine certain conversations yeah. And it worked immensely well for me. And so that's sort of like maybe it's not a dark secret, but a secret for people yeah. that are really big into the law of attraction industry is that there's this other side to it. People that are wanting to date utilize yeah. these techniques in particular. And so um, which, uh, it's an interesting, we, I don't think we we would ever actually mention that. So uh, yeah, you know, I, I I really I only recently started to talk about it. I only recently started to feel comfortable actually talking about it because in the past, you know, I, I always wanted to, but I felt uncomfortable because I come from like a fa like I always imagine like people who are watching this. You know, I have like family members and like my my parents, friends watching it, and it's kind of taboo in third world country, sort of like Southeast Asian cultures, you know, to talk about this kind of stuff. Right. But uh, you know, I, I realize I'm I'm kind of I'm not really sharing the real truth because a lot of people. Uh, who who are in this dating industry, you know, they would really resonate with it. And I'm just like, you know, if I'm not sharing the truth, I'm not really being authentic. So uh, at this point, I'm I'm less, yeah. I've gotten to a point within myself where I'm less and less afraid and afraid of this judgment and less, less I suppose, insecure so that I can, uh, I can more comfortably talk about this. Well, there's, a, when you follow people that sort of get into this industry, you can call it, or the law of attraction in general, they may do it for selfish reasons. They want to get that car. They want to make a certain amount of money or whatever it is. And then they find that there's something more to it. Yeah. It leads, it's a natural input. Everybody wants or desires something. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that yeah. desire or craving for that thing. Yeah. But it always starts with that. Like, I really need a new house. I really need yeah. a new car. I want to go. I want to have a, a better girlfriend. It yeah, always yeah. starts with that. And then eventually you start to realize, wow, this is pretty powerful. So when you first started using these techniques, tell me about like your first real like lights on success story that said, wow, I really want to do this. This, this works. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, my, my, my first ever success story. That is a very interesting question. Cause I had, I had lots, lots of success stories, um, that you remember then. Because <laughs> you're yeah. right, we're we're, all, we're always succeeding, even back to our childhood. We just don't know. Yeah, it, right? yeah. I, I suppose like what you mean is consciously using these principles of reality yeah. and like experiencing it. Um, but I mean, you know, I I, I can remember um, the very first time I met my wife, uh, and like she, I I never I didn't even know her back then. And I got on the train and I look to my left and I see this beautiful, gorgeous blonde girl, like just just standing there and I'm like I get tunnel visioned and uh you know I all of these principles all the training that I did in dating and just putting myself out there and and taking action just training myself to take action going up there and actually striking up a conversation with her uh you know that was one of the the biggest success stories I would say because it's led to us getting married and having a kid today you know we just had a baby four months ago um congratulations I, I would again, say man. Hmm? congratulations again that's amazing oh, thank you so much Thank you. 
Yeah. So I, I would say that's like one of the very first instances, though it's not a, you know, it, 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 that's more of like a, like a second order consequence of all the training and all the focusing, because at that time I had made an intention because I was kind of dating around, uh, you know, I, I had at that point I was, I was getting success. You know, I got into the best shape of my life. Uh, I was looking good, feeling good about myself, feeling confident. But then I made an intention really consciously to, hey, I want to find a life partner. I want to find a partner uh, who I can grow together with. And shortly after, uh, something like that happened. And prior to that, I was always visualizing using the method of visualization uh, to look at like, hey, I wake up in the morning in my LA mansion next to the woman of my dreams. She's blonde. Uh, you know, I just don't know why. Maybe I played with too many, one too many Barbie dolls when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I go downstairs, I, I go outside and there's my Ferrari uh, right outside the garage. And I forget my keys and my partner, you know, she comes down, she's like, oh, you forgot your keys. And then she throws it to me. I catch them. And then I get into the red Ferrari and I drive out, uh, you know, out, out the gates, the big gates of my mansion, you know, and the the, the, the houses in the hills and the mountains. And, uh, you know, I, I, I drive off pretty much into the sunset. That's what I visualized for a very, very long time. Yeah. Uh, and then to actually see the first piece of that happening when I met my wife, it was just like, like, whoa that that's really crazy. Yeah. And, and the great thing that you're good at teaching is using these principles to gain wealth. And it's yeah. really interesting when you follow different parts of the industry, every time I put a video and I put many, um, yeah. that, you know, wealth affirmations, different techniques to create wealth. There's always a little subset of people that are like, you know, this is not very spiritual. This yeah. is, a, you know, you shouldn't be teaching this. And so it's sort of reflective of, it's a, of a shadow that, that exists where people yeah. are feeling guilty about making money. Yeah. And it really brings that up for me. May, people may not be aware of it. So I'd love to discuss your relationship to this because there is this, this side of us in general that's reflected yeah. in the, there'll be people in the comments now. They're like, you really shouldn't be seeking out wealth, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, that's uh, that's really funny you mentioned that because uh, I see a lot of comments when I speak about money and I speak about wealth creation. A lot of people in this spiritual community, they're very, very, um, you know, I don't want to say misguided, but their relationship with money is kind of what it used to be for me. You know, I would uh, scoff at people who are interested in making money and be like, oh, they're not sincere. Oh, selling. Oh, that is such a nasty deed. And because I was like that, I was broke, you know, exactly. uh, it's, it's the stories that we tell ourselves. And I used to tell myself that story to justify why being broke and being poor was okay. And why being rich was only for is only for a select few, you know, it takes a lot of courage to be able to say, Hey, uh, I, you know, it would be nice to make a lot of money and have a ton of abundance to the point where you don't have to worry about pretty much anything. Like you never have to worry about you know, I, I don't want to brag, but I'm, I'm at a point in my life where I just I don't worry about money anymore. And I don't know if mm -hmm. that's because it's my mindset or because I have plenty of money or maybe my mindset is what brought plenty of money, you know. Um, so, you know, I, I used to be at, at a point in my life where I was pinching pennies and viewing money as scarce. And I had a very toxic relationship with money where I believed it was only for the select few and that is what kept that reality being reflected to me. The mirror principle of reality was in play. Uh, mm -hmm. And so money was the thing that I struggled the most with because of uh, the kind of relationship that I had with it. And it was the final thing that made the biggest difference in my life that, that I believe like, you know, made a, made a conscious, I was able to make a conscious change in my whole reality just by focusing on making more money and changing my relationship towards money. So it takes a certain kind of uh, level of consciousness to get to that point where you say, hey, uh, I do have sick, you know, I do have messed up beliefs around money, but mm -hmm. the truth is it would be nice to have money. I am admitting it, you know, so, you know, a lot of people can never really get to that point because their egos are keeping them stuck in believing that money is somehow um, seeking money is somehow not noble or it's it's uh, it's for the lower lower tier. But uh, to to those spiritual people, I ask, who are you to judge? You know, if you are really following uh, the greatest spiritual teaching, uh, does it not teach you to not judge? 
right? Mm -hmm. So if someone, for me, it's like, hey, if you want to pursue spirituality and scoff at money, that's completely up to you. That's your choice. I don't judge, right? Um, yeah, at the, at the end of the day, it's like true spiritual teaching doesn't really judge others. It's more about you following your own unique path. If you want to follow the spiritual path and evolve spiritually, you need to have the resources to do that. Oh, if absolutely. You, not, you need to travel. You need to buy books. You need yep. to, to be able to be healthy enough to be in a, in a mood and position to seek that spirituality. And so there's this disconnect from the fact that you need the resources to do what you want to do. Yeah. So what I wanted to, the proof is in the pudding with Quasi. We've talked to a lot of people, but I'm telling you, this is the one. If, if you're if you're wanting to seek out wealth, go to realitycreation.com. That's where... Uh, uh, Quasi, realitycreator.com. Re realitycreator.com, sorry. Yeah. And that's where um, you can find about, his, I'll have a link in the description. And um, you have actual proof in the pudding. You have people that you've helped out that have been struggling. They've changed their mindset and they've made money. And so that's what's so important. So what I want to talk to you about is there is a natural limit that people set because of their environment, because of their culture, because of their family. And yep. I see it all the time. Somebody, Somebody's at a job. And they're making 5000 a month and then they lose yep. their job and then they go and find an, another job and they make 5000 a month. There's like a barrier that's created by past and future experiences. What you're specializing in is taking people beyond the barriers and moving beyond those limitations. How, how have you been able to do that? Yeah, so one of the fundamental beliefs that we... Um help people kind of fundamental limiting beliefs that we help people destroy is the belief that resources are scarce. Because when we look at this world of competition, we start to believe that money is scarce. There's only a limited amount of it that gets passed around logically. That makes sense, of course. But, you know, this world isn't all that logical. Science is changing every single day. So uh, I believe that when you follow your own personal path, uh, the wealth that you need to support that to for you to reach your highest potential, your highest expression in this current lifetime, uh, all of those means will be met. And for you, if it's making money, amassing a lot of fame, or becoming like a worldwide artist or being the top of your field, whatever it is, if you truly own that, uh, at first, it's going to be difficult because you've never walked that path before. You will know that it's the right path because it's going to be uncomfortable. So that's the second condition um, where we help people, uh, you know, unlock that that barrier. The barriers are set with what they think they should be doing. Uh, they have these limiting ideas of, oh, others are doing this, so I should be doing this. So they're afraid to take risks and take leaps because the unknown path is just so scary and because it's scary, it doesn't feel right, right? So they confuse discomfort with the feeling of this is not right. But those are two distinct feelings that people um, who haven't tapped into their heart, they're not intuitive enough. They can't really identify. So you have to be able to distinguish between what's actually uncomfortable and what's the right thing to do. Because some, most of the times, the right thing to do is the uncomfortable thing to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Especially if you're walking a path that's your own and there's no blueprint for it, you are creating it every single day. And the final thing that helps with all of this is looking at identity. You mentioned environment. People have an environment that they've grown up in and that environment, uh, you know, it, it's formed their current conception of themselves. They believe that this is me and this is my relationship to the world. I am born in this poor family and I didn't have the resources or knowledge. My parents were only this. So I'd be happy to make maybe that or slightly more, right? But I went from, um, you know, hanging out with people who were barely making like 50 grand a year to people making 50 grand a day. And that just completely blows your world. You know, mm -hmm. I have some of my friends are making like $100,000 a day. Uh, you know, a couple million a month. So that just completely blew my world. I'm like, oh my God, this, there's just di different levels to this game. You know, there is, there are There's, unimaginable, there are unimaginable levels to the game. 
that you can only know about if you have exposure in your environment. And that's why I think having a community, a mastermind is so important, which is what we try to do with our programs, give people exposure to the different levels of individuals that actually exist there. And sometimes, you know, you you keep all the time, if you keep looking up, you forget to look like sideways because you can you can learn from everyone you can learn from someone who's making less money than you you get one or two pieces of wisdom that if you're receptive enough you capture you actually internalize you use it that can lead you to growth as well so it's important to have exposure to all of it you know not just the upper echelons the higher the elites but also looking below to give you real like um a, a real perspective of what the world is not just a fake like biased perspective but a real view at like what you have because sometimes when i look at what i have uh, you know on days when i feel like oh you know all my friends are doing this and i'm doing this i suck but then when i look at the privilege that i have to be able to wake up in a house press a button and all my food and groceries are delivered to my door never have to worry about it not even the king of kings had that privilege even so you know true. a couple hundred years ago so you know, it, it really puts things into perspective. So well put. So true. And you and I both have several videos on identity shifting. Yeah. And it, it is an art to shift your identity. And, and you, you've you helped a number of people in shifting their identity. Help me get started with somebody who has a clear identity of a low, of, of someone in poverty, of someone that struggles, of someone in lack. And yeah. how, what, what are the fundamental tenets of shifting your identity, at least a starting point where yeah. you can, do they need to completely forget who they were before? Yeah. Because that's almost unrealistic in some cases. There's yeah. A, there's a process involved, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So the way in which we uh, provide transformations in our clients is through four main pillars. The first pillar is awareness. And what awareness does, awareness is the thing that attaches to identity. So how I would explain it is if you imagine that there's a room or let's say the universe or the, the earth, it has an mm -hmm. atmosphere, it has air. Now, if I put a bubble, if I create a bubble within this atmosphere, it captures a certain portion of the air, right? And this bubble starts to think that it is separate from the air outside. This air is different from the air outside. It takes a form instead of being that formless, uh, infinite consciousness. This consciousness takes a form. So when awareness takes on form, we call it identity. So when we start to, our awareness starts to identify with the thoughts that we think, the feelings that we feel, um, who we are in relationship, it's typically the thoughts and feelings. That's what we call identity. So when you uh, can really step back from the masks that you've been wearing, uh, what you've been calling as yourself, the thoughts and feelings you've been identifying with. You take a step back and you can rest as awareness. That's the first pillar fulfilled. Now mm -hmm. we can begin to consciously create because if our cups are full, we can't really create anything from a full cup. We need to first empty our cups, take our existing masks off so we can create the mask that is the most appropriate to put on. So that's the first step, awareness. The mm -hmm. second step is clarity. And identities are created based on what we want to accomplish, right? So what we would like to experience. That's the uh, universal constant because our, our souls come into this earth, into the world to work out a certain form of karma. And, and that karma is typically de um, determined by our previous lifetimes and what we have experienced, what we have lacked. Maybe for me, uh, what I have lacked was status and wealth. And that's why I'm interested in it. Or, you know, being able to be the best at what I'm doing, which is, again, leads to the core drivers of status and wealth. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's why I'm so interested in that. But I focus on growing and becoming better and the best in my field every single day, being the best that I can be. Because, you know, I have found out that my core driver is, um, is the fear of mediocrity. I want to be exceptional at what I do. So, you know, that's what we teach our clients to get clear on, which is, what do you want? Why do you want it? And who must you become in order to achieve it? When what, why, or who are congruent, then the how and when takes care of itself. So what, when you focus on the what that you want, the money, the house, the whatever it is that you want to experience, the success, uh, then you're intellectually clear about what you want. When you know why you want it, that core emotional driver, 
the feeling that I have in my heart that drives me the fire in my belly. That is emotional clarity. So mm -hmm. now we're intellectually and emotionally clear. Our mind and our hearts are congruent. The final thing that needs to come together is understanding who I must become to effortlessly accomplish that as a neutral. A lot of the times people get very inconsistent results in their lives. We see clients who come in, they get inconsistent results in their businesses. It's a, it's a roller coaster inconsistency in their revenue. One month they make a lot of money, next month they go down. And they just see inconsistencies in other areas of their lives. Why does this happen? Because they haven't become the person who's worthy of effortlessly creating that. So the third level of clarity is the identity level clarity. So intellectual, emotional, and identity level clarity leads to how and when. The strategies that need to happen, the actions that need to be taken, they will naturally appear in your worldview. And the timing of when things happen will get taken care of. But unfortunately, what most people do and most gurus teach you online is you got to immediately focus on the how and you got to immediately focus on when you want it. When the mindset is incorrect, if they're not ready, mm -hmm. you can give a monkey a hammer. It just wouldn't know what the fuck to do with it. Right. <laughs> right. So exactly. we're just we're just turning this this monkey mind and making ourselves more and more intelligent, raising our levels of consciousness so that you can give a really smart, intelligent human being a paperclip and they would make a rocket ship out of it, you know, theoretically. Exactly. Yeah. So um, it's, it's really, it's, it's really about the, the strategies and tactics. It's more about the person behind them that makes, I, I, I would say like, if I could quantify it over 80% of the work is done there. Now that's the second pillar, uh, clarity. The third pillar is creation methods to project that reality that they want to create and that identity that they need to embody in order to effortlessly live that. So through the means of visualization, identity shifting techniques, uh, we teach our clients how to create that reality every single day. And finally, we talk about coordination. The fourth pillar to mastering this process is coordination, which basically means learning how to keep yourself in balance. So what happens is when you make the decision to embody a new uh, identity, a new version of yourself, or to experience a reality that's starkly different from uh, what you're experiencing now, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be challenging. Life will throw tests your way. Now, life isn't evil, and it doesn't say that I'm going to throw tests your way. It just naturally happens within the context of our worldview because we're not experienced, we're not used to experiencing this reality yet. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when someone goes from having no money to having a shit ton of money, then they're afraid that people are going to try to sue them uh, and try to take their money. So they have to protect their wealth. So when you go from no money to a lot of money, your problems just evolve. Now you have the problem of, I need to protect my wealth and my assets, right? So, you know, these problems don't go away. It's just you evolve to be able to deal with them your identity has to evolve. So coordination is learning how to deal with those challenges and tests that appear in your worldview so that your internal, the identity that you've chosen to create, it doesn't get shaken. It's unperturbed. And when these four pillars come together, we see our clients become immensely successful. Uh, I was just making a video earlier today about one of our clients who joined us in 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, he was like 19 years old, making 20K a month. Uh, three years later, now he's doing over half a million dollars a month in a completely wow. new business. And he has two different businesses now. And I, I'm pretty sure he's making even more now. This was back in 2023. I haven't spoken to him yet. But again, all as a result of shifting his identity, becoming a completely different person. I'd love to get your thoughts on the interplay with, with just imagining and taking action. There's yep. certainly a disagreement in, in the community about doing that. You know, Abraham Hicks yep. says, you just got to sit and imagine and it will come. And then others will say, it's all about action. And to me, action is like a prayer. It's like me having faith in what I've imagined. It's like I'm taking that step forward. And yeah. I've always been able, that, that's been the key for me. But yeah, I'd like to get your 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 particular opinion about that. Yeah, you know, in any school of thought, when there's two extremes, typically the right answer is somewhere in the middle. It's never mm -hmm. one extreme or the other. It's never massive action only, no mindset, or only mindset, no action, right? So it's typically a, a perfect combination of both. You just have to find out what that right combination is for you. Uh, and that's why, you know, in ancient uh, Eastern, um, you know, it, uh, Indian cultures, there is, mm -hmm. a, there is what's known as a guru, right? The guru, the word guru literally translates to dispeller of darkness, guru. 
And, uh, you know, when you have a guru, your guru will know the perfect cocktail, the perfect combination of different spiritual practices for your own unique karma, because they can see things that you can't. And that's the, that's the benefit of having a mentor, someone who can see into who you are, how you've been, experience you, and, and just know what the right thing will be for you. So yeah. in terms of imagination and action, uh, what's the right thing to do? I think anyone who tells you to just do one uh, has a fundamental misunderstanding of action and mindset because the way I look at it, uh, mindset and action are just two separate parts of one coin. It's just two different sides to the coin. Action is an expression of mindset. It's a representation. It's an extension of the correct imagination. You know, you could imagine a red Ferrari all day long. What's the point if you get it and you don't receive it or you don't go out there and actually drive it, right? right. The yeah. manifestation isn't complete. And even in the act of imagining, it is still an act. It's an internal action. It's all action. It's either yeah. internal action or external action, but ideally you do both. Now, something I know you've confronted with clients, as I have, is uh, you get somebody that desperately wants that job, desperately wants to make that move, desperately needs to meet that girl, whatever it is. It's yeah. this desperation, this level of importance. It's almost like a disease yeah. that, that, that people have. They don't quite understand. There, there, there's a level of letting go yeah. uh, involved in the process. Yeah. How do you view that? Yeah, so I always remind them of the of the lesson of coordination because if your importance level is too high, you're going to create artificial resistances that just didn't need to exist in the first place. And the way I like to demonstrate that is, let's say I have an intention and I'm moving forward with my intention. Let's say I wanna I wanna you know walk across a tightrope on a very high precipice. Now, if I'm doing it for the first time, I will have a lot of resistance. I'll have a lot of fear in my heart because I've never done it before. And most of my intention energy will be going into resisting the fall rather than moving forward to the other side, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm resisting failing more than I am focusing my intention on succeeding. And the chances are, if I do make it to the other side, um, I will be drained. I'll feel drained. And so most of the times people feel drained because they've been fighting an invisible force while at the same time trying to move forward towards their goals. But if we let that go and just simply follow that the, the wave, there's a wave of life, right? When you make an intention, you let go and you surrender yourself to that intention. The flow of life will take you there. At certain times, you will need to intervene and to just correct course. But that's literally what the focus should be on. Once you've made the intention, you just trust that somehow it's going to be delivered to you. That's the correct balance. In yeah. yoga, they call it the balance between vairagya and abhyasa, uh, the, the balance between effort and surrender. To succeed in any spiritual path and any goal of achievement, there has to be that right balance between putting in effort and surrendering that effort. And the way I like to look at that is process orientation. If I have correct processes in place, whether it be for my business, my personal life and, and my health, uh, or my dating, uh, if I have a process in place and I just do the process to the best of my ability, I give what I can and I leave the rest to God, God will take care of everything else. And that's why, you know, a lot of people, when they take, when they talk about not taking action, the way I look at it is it's kind of disrespectful to God and the universe. If you're not taking action, you're just going to sit around and wait for God to deliver you what you want. You know, it's like you right. get what you give. The more I give, the more the universe reflects the more the universe gives back that's how the, what the mirror reflects if i'm giving to the mirror the mirror is giving back to me so that's why you know in my in all of my content i try my best to give as much away for free as possible i'd love to go back to clarity a little bit i, I know yeah. that that when when you look out at the world a lot of people sort of get stuck on what they want and what their vision is by these outside forces the media is telling them something there's different pendulums that come along the way that take sort of take our energy away it's yeah. very subtle but i i see people all the time it's like they're they're zombies yeah like they're, they're they're something they're being used to create some other reality that they're they're they have no active agent as a part of yeah and so sometimes it's deprogramming some somebody from these outside forces and you know how do you how do you go about helping somebody if a client comes along and clearly they're just 
latched onto some sort of outside force, egregore pendulum yeah. that, that is doing that. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, I, you know, I think the the very first thing we do with awareness undoes a lot of the the work from the egregores and and the and the pendulums, because once you take a step back from all of the things that you identify with, uh, you no longer give them your energy. You no longer give the pendulums your energy because most of the times the things you're identified with are the things that the pendulums have programmed within you to want to like. The other thing we do is uh, focusing on thinking feelingly. I love this from Neville. Neville Goddard talks about this a lot. Learning to think feelingly is like training a new muscle. It's like when I think about my goals, I don't think that I want something because this is what I should want, right? So I begin with a picture in mind and then I really feel like what would set my heart free? What would make life a continual vacation? If I could do something every day for free for the rest of my life with nothing to gain from it. Because the the act of doing it, the act of living it is the end. That is the fulfillment. What would that be? If I could allow myself to have anything, what would really, you know, it's, it's a feeling of what makes my life just so joyous. You know, it just makes it so wonderful. It makes it wonderful every single day. I don't care what happens. You know, I'm just so happy and so grateful that I get to experience this every single day. Just focusing on that feeling. When you focus on that feeling, the images, the thing that will lead you to getting there, that will show up in your world. So to give you an example, when I when I visualized that mansion in LA waking up next to the partner of my dreams, uh, there were things in there that I was conditioned to want, like the red Ferrari. I don't really care about a red Ferrari. You know, it's nice if I have it, really? but it wouldn't make the, you know, like I, I don't care much about it. I could, you know... I could probably, I, I would definitely buy a Ferrari right now, but it just wouldn't make sense. You know, it just, I don't really want it anymore. Right. Those kinds of wants that you think you want as you progress on the journey and you follow, you know, this kind of system of awareness, clarity, creation, coordination, the false desires that you have that you thought you wanted, they naturally fall off. You become disinterested in them. And the real things start to show up when you keep focusing on uh, ha having that awareness, stepping back, from time to time to have a third person view, a bird's eye view of your life and, and, and the world around you. And really just understanding what your heart wants, listening to your heart, spending time with yourself, you know, spending time in stillness and quiet. What are those core desires that if one of them or two of them were fulfilled, it would just make everything worth it, you know? And it's, yeah. and it's typically things that are continuous. It's an art that you do, you know, uh, you know, so, something that you um, continually do that that brings that kind of fulfillment into your life. So the this brings me back a little bit to uh, your your origin story because a lot of people that end up in working for someone else, yeah, it, it's it's a natural like somebody is telling you what to feel and they're giving you your own um, you know goals and ideals that are not really yours. So I make the argument a lot of times if you really want to achieve true wealth and freedom. You need to work for yourself. Most mm. of the the people that I meet in general that are, are that are wealthy, that are abundant, that are creating their reality in the way they want, they have the freedom to do what they want. Not all. I mean, there's definitely people. There's some CEOs. There's some people that is at certain places. But in general, what is your opinion about that? Yeah. Is, is it much more helpful to start your own business or does it matter? You know, that's a good question. I used to think about that a lot because before I used to, I used to kind of believe something similar that, Hey, you know, I should be, um, I should be running my own business, but I honestly feel like if you're backing a worthwhile mission and mm -hmm. as long as you, it's, it's still your own choice. Like we're still, cause think about it. If I'm running a business, it's actually a lot harder than, you know, at least starting up a business. It's a lot harder than having a job, right? Like you're responsible for your be. success, yeah. whether or not you eat or not. You know, so you're hundred percent responsible. If one month you don't make money, you don't get fed. Your family doesn't get fed. So you're hundred percent responsible for all of that. But the only caveat is there's no limit to your success. You're, you're not really capped by anything, right? So, you know, if, if you can get into a role, that's a hybrid, like, you know, think commission sales roles, there's no limit to your success. You just, the more sales you make, the more, more money you're going to make. So, and, and even more than that, like not everyone is interested in, in, in doing that. Like my mom, you know, she's interested in having a role that makes her feel like she's part of something larger. 
So different people have different desires. Um, for a lot of people, they value their personal freedom a lot. Uh, for them, maybe starting their own business, you know, people who are stubborn, kind of like me and don't want to follow instructions. And I hate, list, you know, just having other people right. tell me what to do because most of the times I, I, I used to think that I was smarter than all of them. Uh, <laughs> but also I used to, I used to really think like, why should I let someone else dictate what my life is? And that was something, you know, my freedom, my time is something that I, that I value a lot. And so for me, it made sense to go into entrepreneurship initially. Um, but now it's just like, if someone were to start off, it doesn't necessarily have to be entrepreneurship. Like you start off, you can, it, it all depends long-term what you want to accomplish. Like if you want something that no one else in the world is doing, then by all means, you should start a business. But otherwise, don't start a business for the sake of starting a business because you want freedom. Right. Exhaust other pathways first of where you can control your own time, but at the same time, have the backing of a really great company that you believe in and that you could work for free for, for the rest of your life. Even if you can find that, then that's a, that's, I think a bonus. Can we use these techniques to manipulate time? Have you had success in manipulating time, slowing down time, speeding up time, going back mm -hmm. and changing stuff that's happened in the past, anything like that, that you, I, I know that you're always looking at, at more advanced stuff when, when we talk. So have you yeah, ever you know, utilized any of that? Yeah. So I've never really utilized that because you know, at, at this point in my journey, I'm not, I'm not quite interested because it, it's just what, like, what is it really going to do? You know, I just want to move right. forward and, and grow every single day and, uh, and just become better and, and, you know, change the world one person at a time. Um, but in terms of manipulating time, I remember thinking, uh, you know, listening to the Mandela effect, right? The, the, the Mandela effect where, where, you know, they talk about the past, not remembering the past as it was because we've had a shift in timeline. But if you, if you, if you're, if you consciously work on creating your own reality, um, you're going to be shifting timelines all the time because you're not following that predetermined path that the pendulums have dictated for you. You're deciding every single moment uh, which path you want to move forward in. So in a way, you are manipulating time just by the the virtue of your intention and the decisions that you're making. How do you treat memory? Memory seems to play a pivotal role in our consciousness and, and in reality creation, memory of the, memories of the past. We can have false memories. We can change memories. So, yeah. so how, how have you come to grips with you utilizing and dealing with memory? Yeah, I think it's, for me, it's, it's less memory and more the contextualization of memory, like how I relate to the memory. So if I look at a memory in the past where I got bullied as negative, then this will lead me to experiencing negative outcomes in my life in the future. But mm -hmm. if I relate to the memory of being bullied as this is something that's positive that's happened to me and it's going to somehow serve me even though I can't see it yet, then what's likely is it is I'm going to start seeing more instances of how it is serving me. And that's ex exactly what happened in my case. You know, when I started to move countries and go to different countries, I became very, very adaptable to different situations and made friends very quickly. And even when I go into social environments, uh, you know, I make friends very, very quickly uh, and I find my circle, the right people, and I can socialize pretty much with anyone. Uh, and I can only do that because I have good communication skills from getting bullied so much. I have like, at least I believe I don't, I hate tooting my own horn, but you know, there's no other way to <laughs> represent my point is, uh, I can, I feel like I can, um, relate to people better, understand people better. And it makes me a better, um, communicator when I make videos, uh, and even in sales, anything people related, I'm good at because I've gotten bullied. Like that intensely painful thing in my life, I've turned into intensely uh, grow, uh, what's the word? Growth oriented. Mm -hmm. The thing that's given me the most growth. I, I absolutely relate to that 100%. Yeah. So I wanted to ask about specificity because you have a video where you talk about think and grow rich. And I know that you and I have used the same technique where I would yeah. look in the mirror every day and I'd say, I'm so happy and grateful. I've received $10,000, you know, yeah. and I give a specific amount of money. And I did that for a while. Yeah. And then at the same time, I've noticed when I'm kind of doing that, I'm in my head. So yeah. when I, when I'm relating to it on a feeling based level, the specificity of the number that I'm looking for kind of goes away. What yeah. works best? If somebody really wants a specific amount, does that work? Or yeah. should we should we work in generalities? Yeah, so 
I believe, again, with, with a question like this, it's just to look at the two extremes. One extreme is extreme specificity. The other extreme is extreme generalization. What's the middle ground? The right answer is somewhere in the middle ground. A lot of people are very, very mind oriented. They're very logical, analytical people. And for these people, so what I notice is, you know, when you go to seminars, right, there's different kinds of seminars, different kinds of speakers come up. Some speakers are very analytical and logical, and they appeal to the mind of those who are logical and analytical. And when these people get enough meat for the mind, they feel the conviction, but they need that. They feel inspired and energized because, hey, I have a clear formula. I have, you know, clear business tactics and strategies. So now I can go and execute and achieve my goals. The conviction comes as a result of the mind opening its gates because its logical checkboxes have been met. For other people who are more faith oriented, they go to these seminars and it's all jumping around and you know shouting around the motivational junky stuff, but they feel inspired the same way, mm -hmm. right? So it's all really about the heart. We're all just taking different pathways to getting the heart activated because that is the the center of what's known as outer intention, the powerful intention that makes our worlds um, work the way that it does and, and it moves mountains, right? So uh, to, to answer your question, I think it depends on the kind of person. If you're someone who's very logical and analytical, you need specificity. That's completely fine. But if you are less so, you're more of a feelings person, you're more of an artist, you focus more on the world that you're creating, the art that you're creating and what it makes you feel, right? So for me personally, I am more on the analytical side. I like to look at numbers, numbers make sense to me. But then when I look at numbers, you know, I look at what does this number mean? What could it enable me to do? What would it make my life? How does this number make my life a continual vacation? Right. So it's again, getting that heart and mind coherence. That's, that's the crucial part with, with answering this specificity question. What amount of specificity allows you to get that coherence between heart and mind? Thank you for that. So one thing that you're really good at teaching is visualization. Yeah. And I, I, for some reason, I get a lot of people that say, I, I can't visualize. They claim to have some sort of uh, some sort of sickness that doesn't allow them to. I know there are people Af that- Aphantasia, right? Right, um, aphantasia. But I've actually worked with people that claim to have aphantasia and, and, and they're able to get out of it. But um, you know, how long should we visualize? Is there any particular techniques other than the general just bringing up the image that you have used th that has helped you in teaching visualization properly? Yeah, that's a really good question. So- um... For the people who claim they have aphantasia, uh, again, I don't know your individual situation. You may genuinely have aphantasia or you might believe you have aphantasia, uh, though I don't know if there is a huge, huge difference because the mind creates a lot of the um, a lot of the ailments that we experience, the psychosomatic illnesses. Uh, that's why the placebo effect actually exists. So I feel like you can overcome it. Is it 100% necessary too? No, because the goal with visualization is again, heart and mind coherence, right? So we're trying to achieve that heart and mind coherence. We're creating a picture and then we're feeling the feelings associated with it. So we're directing our minds and we're powering up that image with the feelings of our heart. You know, that's the way I like to think about it. But you can easily do that with affirmations, focusing on a particular mm -hmm. outcome and feeling that, thinking about the affirmation and feeling that. So there are many other methods. All of these are methods, right? You can do it with sound. So or any kind of sensory um, organ that you can utilize, you can do it with feel. You feel what it feels like. You can touch the ideal scene, the, the, the house that you live in. You can touch the walls. Maybe you can't visualize, but you can touch. So you can do it with a myriad of different um, uh, methods. But I believe visualization is the most effective because what, what, what's the number? 80 or 90% of our sensory perception is, is seeing. And so when someone goes blind, all of their other senses get so heightened, they can start to like smell things they couldn't in the environment. They can smell their partner's sweat from a mile away. You know, they can hear things from a mile away. So everything else, get, all the other senses get heightened because the sight, the, the sense of sight overwhelms our brains, uh, the sensory uh, receiving part of our brain so much. So in terms of answering the question of, how long should we visualize for? Studies have shown that the most effective way to visualize, and I and I got this from Huberman, who's done a lot of research on this, um, mm -hmm. short bursts of visualization is more effective than 
long, prolonged periods of visualization, meaning, you know, 20 second max, you know, you spend 20 seconds mm-hmm. visualizing and feeling it, feeling the outcome, as opposed to a long drawn out visualization of five minutes. It's difficult to focus on visualizing a picture for that long, even with people who are experienced visualizers and people who don't have aphantasia. So it's recommended that you do short frequent bursts of, of visualization rather than one long chunk. We just want to systematically illuminate that picture in our mind and power it up with our feelings, energize it. And that's how I've been doing it for the last eight years. That's yielded, I believe, really great success for me and and our clients. Um, what was the what was the final question? No, you, about- you got it all. You covered it. Okay. So but the, the, the thing I um, love about you is you're an avid reader. You're always looking for the next secret, the next new system, the next thing. And you can that's reflected in your videos. So is there anything cool that you've that you're reading right now that you can share with us? Any any new authors, new systems, new techniques, anything like that? Yeah, you know, um, I went to a seminar and I was reading. Um, I, I actually didn't read his book, but I, I I started reading it after the seminar. But the I can't remember his not his name, but I shared it with my sales teams. But his the book the name of the book is I actually have it right here. It's by Todd Herman. It's called um. It's called The Alter Ego Effect. Mm -hmm. And uh, in it, it's, you know, when he was speaking, I was like, oh my God, this is what I've been teaching our clients for the last five, six years. And he talks about identity, the power of secret identities. And, you know, it's, it's just like, he's worked with really big athletes and how he's noticed that all of these athletes, they have an alter ego to them. And this alter ego, you know, Kobe called himself um, Black Mamba, uh, mm-hmm. Beyonce had an alter ego, uh, Sasha, uh, Sasha Fierce, you know, she sure. used that to step into a different version of herself. And, you know, this kind of goes in line with my teaching of the uh, identity is everything. Identity is your complete internal world. And if my internal world is ultimately what gets reflected into my external world, what would happen if I completely change my internal makeup? You know, I would experience a completely different reality. Right. So that's one of the things that I've been, uh, you know, dabbling with recently. I've been really like I, I've been reading that book and it's and it's very, very good. And it's just like, wow, it's just it, it confirms everything that we've been doing with our clients for the last five years. And, uh, you know, it's it's great to see these um, these athletes doing it, too. And Todd was sharing a story uh, about his daughter and saying how um, he um you know, his daughter was like getting bullied in in, in school. Uh, she was like, she wanted to play tag with the boys, but the boys were like, oh, you can't play because you're not fast enough and you're a girl. Mm-hmm. And she was like, what? what do you mean I'm not fast enough? I'm in track. And they were like, no, you're a girl, you can't play. And then the next day she had a big race. She was very, very disheartened by that. And she started to believe that she wasn't fast enough. And so Todd was like, hey, uh, what? Uh, who's the fastest character you can think of? And uh, she was like, oh, Chase from uh, from Paw Patrol or, you know, wh- whatever that that that, <laughs> yeah, that, right. that show is. Right. Yeah. And he was like, he took a headband and he was like, I have blessed this headband with the powers of Chase. When you put it on, you will be the fastest uh, you can ever be, even faster than Chase. And so the next day she goes, puts it on, runs the race and she wins it, you know? And right. it's just like, it's so much easier to do that with kids because they're so accepting and their rational mm-hmm. minds, the God is so much lower. You can convince them of a lot. You can help them achieve great things just by at that early age, you know, getting them to step into that identity. But how many times has it been in your life where you've, you know, kind of channeled a different version of yourself? You've stepped in, you've gone into a completely different zone and you felt different. Exactly. You know, maybe what it was doing a great work of creativity. You're a writer, you write books. Maybe you step into a different zone. You become a different version of, of Brian. You know, when you, when you, when you step in. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's something I've been, uh, I've been reading lately. So uh, the, the, the final thing I wanted to ask now that you have a four month old, it changes your perspective even more. You, you, you start to have memories of when you were, and and you start to have a, a shift in perspective on how the world is created and how has that sort of changed and shifted and expanded your understanding of the universe? (laughs) Man, that is a that is a really difficult question. But for me, it's just like, you know, a lot of the times um, I hear fathers, like pe- people who become dads make excuses about how, oh, you know, I don't have time to go to the gym now that I have kids. 
I don't have time to do the things that I want to do because I have kids. And for me, it's like, you know, I'm going to break that status quo. I'm going to be even better now that I have a kid. I'm going to be an even better version of myself. So, you know, I've continually, I've been the most disciplined I have ever been in my life. Uh, I've been eating the healthiest that I have ever eaten in my life. Um, our business is doing the best it's ever have done in our entire mm -hmm. life, in my entire life. We had a record month the month my son was born, even though I spent two weeks, uh, you know, pretty much like three nights in the hospital and then the next three or four weeks, you know, uh, waking up in the middle of the night or really early mornings to do feeds with the baby. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just like, Maybe I am, I've always told myself that my identity is I'm the kind of person who does even better when there's challenges and there's pressure. That's always been part of that identity that I've crafted for myself. But, you know, it's again, at the end of the day, it's really about the event that happens and more about how you view that event, what your worldview and your self view, your identity is. And so I believe that, you know, having a kid has just been, it's been nothing but a blessing in my life. And you know, it's, it's made me better in every single way. And before having a kid, I was afraid. I was like, oh no, life's going to change so much. Uh, I might not do as well in my, in the areas that I'm interested in, but that's, it's been quite the contrary. So true. You start to you get a chance to re-experience everything for the first time. You'll, yeah. you'll start to see what I'm saying more and more movies that you've already watched. You're like, I can watch that again through the, through the eyes of my kids, you know? And right. So it, it's kind of cool. You get to re-experience life again, kind of. So, right. You live but, almost vicariously through them in the, in a new exactly. generation. So realitycreator.com. Please check out, please check out Quasi's YouTube channel. You'll have the link in my description. Uh, there's so many incredible videos to unpack there. So much to learn. I'm so grateful that I got a chance to talk to you again and congratulations on all of your success. I, I'm so excited every time I see one of your videos blowing up or when I hear about how you're doing. And so you're one of my favorite people. You're an example to me of why this, what we do is working and you're really helping a lot of people out. So, so thank you so much, brother. Dude, thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. Always a pleasure when when we speak and, uh, you know, we we always have great energy together and we talk about some real For interesting sure. stuff. Welcome to the reality revolution, brother. We return you now to your local announcement.